Okay, so our, our next speak, speaker is, is Hans Renata. And in the same way that uh, Dave ma had made a big impact on his uh, mentor's research um, uh, d during his uh, postdoctoral studies, Hans has done the same thing because Hans, Hans has got a very interesting background. Uh, he had his uh, BS BA from Columbia University and then did a PhD with Phil Barron, so really very serious um, ma major scale synthesis uh, PhD in 2013. And then, and then he went to postdoc with Francis Arnold, um, and and basically he he played a very pivotal role in in the uh, in the work of the Arnold group to moving P450 enzymes to do catalysis uh, that are not natural to nature. And basically, I was very excited in what he achieved there because he was involved uh, in developing novel catalysts that that uh, could do carbene transformations. And so with this tremendously strong background in, in both uh, large scale synthesis and obviously the major develops in, uh, in uh, enzyme uh, evolution for novel reactivity, uh, when he started his independent career, he had two very powerful skill sets. So in 2016, he, he was, he, he's, he's been at uh, Scripps Research Institute in Florida uh, and uh, has, has developed um, some wonderful examples of how you can use uh, enzymatic strategies to really impact uh, uh, significant um, uh, synthesis of important natural products. And so we're very excited to hear his talk today, which is biocatalytic CH oxidation as an enabling tool for complex terpene synthesis. Welcome, Hans. Okay, thank you, Hugh, for the kind introduction and also for the invitation to speak here. And of course, thank you for pressing on with the event despite the difficult situation. Uh, today, I'll be sharing with you uh, recent results from the lab in the area of chemoenzymatic synthesis of highly oxidized terpene natural products. Okay, broadly speaking, my lab is interested in developing useful enzymatic tools for the uh, synthesis of complex molecules. And in this regard, we're especially interested in the development of enzymatic CH oxidation. Uh, we realize that there's still a lot of challenges in doing this oxidation chemistry using small molecule reagents or catalysts because it's really hard to get uh, useful selectivity sometimes and enzymes because of their exquisite selectivity profile, we thought that they can be advantageous if applied in this uh, scenario. And we realized that uh, by doing so, we can come up with uh, access to unique building blocks. And if you combine this with emerging methods in organic synthesis, we might be able to come up with efficient synthesis of bioactive natural products. And in the bigger picture, I guess, we would like to show that this approach can be complementary to uh, traditional ways of making molecules as well as chemocatalytic CH functionalization methods to make complex molecules. And not only that, we also hope to show that we can come up with novel disconnections that ultimately can also be efficient. Now, Phil Barron likes to think that uh, things are better if you include some Elon Musk reference. So I'm gonna insert some, try to insert some Elon Musk reference here, and hopefully you will be able to see the parallel. Uh, this quote is taken from a documentary that I just watched on Amazon Prime this past weekend. Thank you for work from home. Um, so I quote, a lot of people have this perception that if you buy electric, it's because you have some sort of electric fetish and one of the things that is incredibly important is to break that perception and show that electric car can be better than any gasoline car. And I think similarly, I think that today there's still this perception that if you do biocatalysis, it's because you have some sort of biocatalytic fetish. And I think that it's important that we break that perception and show that biocatalytic synthesis or enzymatic synthesis can be 
can offer a lot of advantages over traditional synthesis. And just some housekeeping uh, before we uh, go into the real science, uh, this slide shows uh, a variety of metal enzymes that nature uses for oxidation of small molecules. Uh, we work in this space, uh, so we work with P450s and uh, non heme deoxygenases or alpha KGs. Uh, they have several notable differences. The P450s are heme containing enzymes. And they also require a dedicated reductase protein partner. This will be important later on in our discussion. The alpha KGs are non-heme enzymes that contain this two histidine and one carboxylate ion binding motif and also uses this uh, ketoglutaric acid as cosatrate in the reaction. Now, in contrast to the P450s, they don't require dedicated reductase and you can reduce them to the uh, ferrous form by using um, simple reductants such as sodium ascorbate. Just okay, quickly. Um, just a quick thing, there's a little pop-up that's blocking the corner of your screen. Uh, how do I remove that? Yes. Uh, minimize like this? Yes, yeah, build order. Okay, are we good? Still there. Uh, I don't know how to remove it. Um, good enough? I think good enough, no? Are you able to move it off to the side? Uh, I, I tried to move it all the way to the side. Is this good now? Better? It's, it's still showing up the same on my end. Uh, I, okay. I don't know what to do. <laughs> it says a uh, build order. Oh. Um, let me see if I can. It might be, it might be underneath your program. Uh, maybe I, let me stop sharing first and try to remove that. One second. Wait, hold on. Okay. Looks How about great. Now? Yeah, good. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, so we became interested in this highly oxidized terpenes. And when we look at these structures, we noted that there is a certain motif that keeps occurring again and again. This manifests in the form of this hydroxy trimethyl decalin motif that's present in either the trihydroxy trimane or the trihydroxy and isocopylene unit in a lot of terpenes. And you can find this in more than hundreds of terpenoids. Um, typically, when people try to build terpenoids like this, they will either rely on biomimetic polyinsaccharization or uh, doing a more modular synthesis starting from Willem Mischer ketone. And we thought that we can come up with a, a complementary strategy to build such terpenes by uh, using chemoenzymatic approach. And our idea here is to introduce this hydroxyl group through biocatalytic oxidation starting from terpenes that are commercially available, such as sclerolite or scleriol. And then after that, we'll build the C and D ring of the target molecule through, uh, uh, I guess, contem contemporary methods in organic chemistry. Uh, we performed a little bit of enzyme engineering to optimize the hydroxylation of scleriol and sclerolite, and we were able to get good, very good conversion and exclusive C3 selectivity in all cases. And this is complementary to chemical approaches that always goes to C2, which is the init oxidation sites for uh, sclerolite. Now, taking advantage of this platform, we can then come up with modular enantioselective selective synthesis of eight different oxidized metal terpenoids. And we can do this in less than 12 steps, highlighting the uh, versatility and also the enabling power of this strategy. So after this, we decide to set our sites on uh, different types of terpenoids uh, at Scripps, this is commonly known as the wall of benzene slide that's designed to overwhelm you with the sheer number of structures. Uh, in, in this case, the take home is that uh, all these three families, the n corins the n atosines and n tracheolobanes are very large and diverse. They contain many different members. And you might also note that the n corin 
the end at the same and the end flaculopin uh, are rather similar in structure. They only differ in the identity of their CD ring where N chlorine has this three to one bicycle and at the same has this two to two and N flaculopin has this three to one zero uh, tricycle. Now they actually share a common precursor by synthetically. They all arise from n copolyl pyrophosphate. And it's commonly thought that uh, there will be an initial cyclization reaction that cyclized n copolyl pyrophosphate to n thimerenyl cation. This can then undergo different Wagner Mirwin shifts to give rise to either the n chlorine, n adenosine, or n tachylobin skeleton. And after that, tailoring enzymes would then take over. And this can happen in the form of direct oxidation or oxidative rearrangement to give rise to many different members of the respective families. Now, why do we care about these natural products? Uh, it was reported in 2016 that one member of the n current family, Queen Jensen A, is a unique inhibitor of heat shock protein 90. And the mechanism is as follows. Uh, so it's shown that congensin A can inhibit a novel site uh, of HSP90, and this can then destabilize this complex that it forms with its client kinase and a co-chaperone CDC37. And the net result is that the client kinase would then be released, and this can be susceptible for degradation. And more recently, another member of the family, Oridonin, was shown to be an inhibitor of NLRP3 uh, inflammasome. You might have come across this article at CNN News uh, about the uh, potentially useful application of, of inhibiting this inflammasome for uh, uh, tackling a lot of common diseases. The idea is that this in, uh, NLRP3 inflammasome, when activated, can form a hexamer that in turn can uh, activate caspase 1 and also uh, cytokines such as interleukin 1b, and this would then trigger a like a feedback loop essentially of inflammation. And one common mechanism between the two natural products is that they both contain this enone as a microacceptor that can engage uh, reactive cysteine in the proteomes. So the idea is that if you can gain access to many different members of the family, you can potentially uh, develop novel covalent inhibitors or probes for biological discovery. And for this reason, as well as the uh, interesting architecture of the natural product, there have been a lot of uh, synthetic approaches towards these molecules, but unfortunately, I don't quite have time today to show all these approaches. I'm just going to focus on prior semi-synthetic approach. Uh, the parent uh, the minimally oxidized version of n corin is actually readily available. This comes in the form of steviocyte, which is the main ingredient of your artificial sweetener, stevia. And we're not the first to come up with this idea to use uh, steviocyte in semi-synthesis. The Baron Lab in 2014 developed this nice access to isoatacine in 13 steps from steviol. However, if you look at the synthesis, uh, you will realize that uh, the types of chemistry that you can do on steviol is quite limited to directed oxidation, starting from this C20 acid or alcohol, and also a little oxidation by taking advantage of this olefin here. And uh, stevi steviol does not contain any uh, useful functional handle for functionalization at other positions of the molecule. And furthermore, it also has this olefin that can potentially be incompatible with a lot of uh, oxidation methods. And to date, I think there is only one example of performing uh, remote oxidation on similar scaffold, and this can be found on electrochemical oxidation of isostabial metal ethyl ester here. Now we realized that if we can come up with useful methods to functionalize either the B or C or A ring of steviol, we will be able to uh, gain access to a wide range of uh, members of n corins And that will be the topic of this talk that I'm going to show you today that we can start from steviol and access a total of nine different natural products. And this can be done by uh, a hybrid oxidative approach that combines chemical and enzymatic oxidations. And you will see later on that the oxidation step that we perform can also uh, enable further 
skeletal rearrangement to gain access to different types of architecture. And in total, we made nine different natural products. Each of them can be made in 10 steps or less, highlighting the enabling nature of this strategy. In terms of the oxidation itself, this is the, uh, I think the blueprint of what we want to achieve. If we can introduce hydroxyl group on the A, B, or C ring of uh, n carinoic acid or stabiol uh, through enzymatic means, we can then use this as functional handles for uh, functional group interconversion to introduce more hydroxyl group. And we can also combine this with direct directed oxidation approach to quickly uh, gain access to highly oxidized members of the family. Okay, this is a biocatalytic uh, talk. So let's do a quick survey of what's known out there. Uh, the C7 hydroxylase is actually known uh, from G. Berlin biosynthesis. However, this enzyme not only catalyzes hydroxylation at C7, it also catalyzes for the oxidation to give rise to this rearranged product uh, that contains the uh, G. Berlin uh, structure. So this is this will be very useful for uh, site selective hydroxylation at C7. There have been quite a bit of investigations into using whole cell fungi uh, for this type of transformation, but this is typically non-selective. You will get uh, oxidation at many different positions, and likely this is because uh, uh, fungal species would contain multiple P450s, and each of these P450s can have different. Um, selectivity profile giving rise to a mixture of products. Luckily for us, uh, our next door neighbor here at Scripps, the Shen Lab has been investigating the biosynthesis of platensiamycin, and they showed that uh, the biosynthesis starts with this end coronal structure that can undergo initially oxidation at C11 uh, with PTMO5, this is a P450. This is then uh, followed by a cyclization step to form this gauge ether motif. In the next step, an alpha KG enzyme, uh, these two are quite similar in sequence, PTMO3 and PTMO6, uh, and they both can catalyze hydroxylation at C7, and this uh, C7 hydroxy group can eventually become the enone moiety of platensimycin after oxidative fragmentation of the A ring. And when we look at this pathway, we realize that PTMO5, PTMO3, and PTMO6 can potentially be useful for our intended uh, use. So we decided to investigate their synthetic utility. We start with PTMO6 because it's the simplest to investigate. It does not require any dedicated reductase. Uh, we just simply uh, test this in in vitro hydroxylation uh, with either stabiol or n corinoic acid. And we observe uh, pretty good turnover numbers. And based on our previous experience, this is usually good enough for synthetic applications. For PTMO5, uh, I mentioned that this is AP450, and P450 requires a uh, reductase coupling partner for electron transfer. And uh, there is no reductase domain that can be found in the original biosynthetic gene cluster. So we have to uh, play around uh, doing artificial fusion with different reductases to determine what's op the optimal chimera. And eventually, we found that we can fuse PTMO5 with RHF red. Uh, this is a reductase from a P450 from Protococcus. Uh, this, can, this gives the best conversion among the three reductases that we tested. I should also mention that we're not the first to uh, uh, use this uh, artificial fusion with RHF red uh, for P450 application. David Sherman was the first one to uh, uh, demonstrate the utility of this fusion. And uh, after that, we then perform a little bit of factor optimization as well as equalized strain optimization to pump up the yield to 88% on a prep scale transformation. So now we've solved the oxidation of the B and C ring of uh, N-corinoic acid or stabiol. Time to turn our attention to oxidation of A ring. Since we have had some luck with using P450-BM3 variants for uh, oxidation of terpenes, we decided to test uh, BM3 variants in our collection for this purpose. And we were delighted to see that we can get some oxidation at C2, but uh, for some of the mutants we tested, we also observed epoxidation at this exo-olefin. But fortunately, a little bit of alien scanning around the active site can tailor this site selectivity until we arrive at this variant called M1.5. 
1177A that is selective for C2 hydroxylation without attaching the epoxide at all. So now we have all the three enzymes. It's time to start doing the intended synthesis. Uh, we'll start with the synthesis of three natural products that uh, contain uh, mainly oxidation on the B-ring. You can see that they have different oxidation patterns. So uh, we want to show that by using one enzyme, we can uh, access all of this uh, different hydroxylation pattern. We'll start with nitrocorinone, starting from n corinoic acid that we can uh, access in two steps from stabiol. We perform oxidation with PTMO6 uh, to hydroxylate at C7. This can then be treated with DMP to the corresponding ketone. And then we found that we can treat this with pyridinium perbromide to affect intramolecular lactonization to complete our synthesis of nitrocorinone in five steps with very high overall yield. Turning our attention to fujinoic acid, if we start from this ketone, essentially we have to oxidize this all the way to the dicarboxylic acid. And this can be achieved by first performing alpha oxidation of the ketone. While we were screening oxidants, we uh, serendipitously found that PTM06 can also catalyze alpha hydroxylation when C7 is in the ketone form. And we found that this is actually a lot higher yielding than uh, reactions using small molecule reagents such as Davis oxyciridine. So from here on, we can just perform uh, oxidative cleavage with sodium pridate and then uh, treat this with DMP to complete our synthesis of fujinoic acid. And then finally for farbocyte A glycone, we decided that we would dehydrate the olefin. For, uh, we actually, we convert the acid to the metal ester uh, that's required in the target molecule. And then we dehydrate the olefin, the, hydroxyl group to the corresponding olefin, and then perform double dehydroxylation with osmium tetroxide to complete our farbocyte A glycone in six steps, uh, again with high overall yield. Next, we decide to uh, look uh, to uh, aim for targets that contain oxidations on multiple rings. Uh, we'll start with this uh, target prostonin C and B. And if you look at the structure, what we need to do is to achieve hydroxylation at C11, C7, and C15, and then reduce that C19 from acid to alcohol or acetate. Now, at this point, we were faced with this dilemma, whether we, have, whether we should oxidize C11 first or C7 first. Um, we can follow the, closely the native pathway of platensomycin biosynthesis by first performing C11 oxidation, followed by C7, However, at, if we do that, we'll, we would uh, be facing potential uh, issues if we, when we want to convert the C7 alcohol from actual to equatorial. We can also think of doing the C7 hydroxylation first and then convert it to the equatorial alcohol and then try to do oxidation, but then now we'll, we'll be faced with potential selectivity issues when acetylating the alcohol to the, uh, this 11 acetate. So eventually we arrived at this, at this decision where we would mask the C7 alcohol as the corresponding ketone in the synthesis. And this can be done by first performing hydroxylation with PTMO6 followed by DMP oxidation. We give rise to this ketone. We can submit this for hydroxylation with PTMO5 to introduce that C11 hydroxyl group. This can then be acylated uh, with uh, acetic anhydride. And at this point, we need to reduce this acid selectively without touching the acetate. And this can be done by first converting the acid to the acyl imidazole and then uh, add sodium borohydride in one pot that reduce this acid all the way to the alcohol without touching the acetate and then also reduce the ketone to the corresponding alcohol. From here on, uh, a little oxidation complete the synthesis of prostonium C and then for the isolation, complete the synthesis of prostonium B. And overall, this can be done in seven steps. Next, we uh, set our sights on fischeraisin B. Uh, so fischeraisin B contains this caged ether that's very reminiscent of platensimycin. And to do so, we first perform hydroxylation with PTMO5 and then uh, treat the product with TFA to affect the intramolecular cyclization. Uh, we need to remove this tertiary alcohol in a deoxygenation chemistry in prior work, we were, we've been using bromination, debromination sequence, but we found that this uh, structure over here 
is actually inert for such sequence. So we had to come up with a workaround. And this can be done by first converting the, uh, as the free acid to the metal ester, and then subjected the product uh, to, for Barton deoxygenation. After that, we can reduce the ester to the uh, primary alcohol with dibol, and then uh, submitted this molecule uh, for alkoxy radical based functionalization to produce this uh, iodoaldehyde that can then be oxidized and cyclized further to pressurize in B. And this can be done overall in nine steps. Okay, now we've synthesized quite a few different end corins. Let's start uh, setting our sights on more complex targets. And here we aim to synthesize the mid-performance. And if you look at the structure of the starting material and the product, you might think that I'm quite nuts in trying to uh, get this to work. And admittedly, uh, this require a few lucky bounces to go our way. Uh, much like this now famous shot from my, famous, my uh, favorite NBA player, Kawhi Leonard. Uh, it's my favorite player uh, because I really aspire to his demeanor and career trajectory. Um, and you will see later on how uh, all of this lucky bounces would play out. The overall idea is that we're going to start from uh, structure from my mouse is missing. Oops. So we're going to start with uh, stabiol and then try to convert it to that uh, structure down below. Uh, that is an n variant structure, and this is known through a rearrangement of stabiol to, n to isostabiol. And starting from this n variant structure, if we can generate a carbocation at C12, we can potentially effect a 1 2 shift that would generate an, at an n at the same product. And from this n at the same product, we can uh, just, uh, if we can come up with a way to do a cyclization between that C13 and C16, we will arrive at a minimally oxidized n trichilobian product that we can then submit it to all of the uh, oxidation processes that we've developed before to gain access to all these uh, three uh, targets. Okay, this is the first lucky bounce that went our way. Uh, when we were hydroxylating isostabiol with ptm 5 we found that it actually oxidized at C12 instead of C11. And with this, we, now we have the necessary functional handle to affect the rearrangement. We can do this by treatment with triflic acid. This affects a one-two shift to generate an n at the same product. Now to cyclize the C13 and C16, uh, we first reduce that ketone to the corresponding alcohol. And we found that we can treat this with Lewis acid in the presence of silane uh, to generate the desired n trichilobian product. We think that this uh, happens through formation of a non-classical carbocation ion structure that it's then uh, quenched selectively by the hydride at that carbon to the end trichilobian product. Now that we have that, we can now begin the oxid oxidation fund. Uh, we'll start with metaphoron C. We first perform C2 oxidation with the BM3 variant that we've developed before. We found that at high enough enzyme concentration, we can actually affect further oxidation to the corresponding ketone. We then submitted the product for hydroxylation with ptm 6 and then uh, do further oxidation with PDC to generate that diketone in the middle. Now we again take advantage of the promiscuous re reactivity of ptm 6 to uh, produce that alpha hydroxy ketone that we can then uh, methylate with diisomethane and oxidize further to, with DMP to generate the diisphenol motif of metriporone C. For metriporone A, we can uh, also perform similar sequence to get metriforum B in just four steps. Uh, I should also mention that we uh, also attempted a different sequence where we first perform hydroxylation at C7 and then try to dehydrate to the olefin followed by uh, direct oxidation to the diketone, but this was found to be rather low yielding and accompanied by formation of that enone on the right-hand side. So we decided to uh, go with the longer route because it gives higher yield. So now we have mitraforum B, we need to convert it to mitraforum A. In the previous synthesis of mitraforum A, uh, Tommy McGower has shown that you can do that final oxidation using uh, either electrochemistry or Christina White's iron PDB catalyst. But we found by accident that if we just leave mitraforum B standing 
uh, in the presence of air, it can actually undergo slow auto oxidation to nitroforin A. And after 14 days, we can get 65% isolated yield of nitroforin A. And this completes our synthesis of nitroforin A in just nine steps with 13% overall yield. Okay, so to conclude, I've shown today that uh, we can start from stable and access nine different natural products, highly oxidized natural products uh, in a very efficient fashion by using a hybrid oxidative approach that combines chemical and enzymatic oxidations. And uh, uh, I think the enabling nature of the strategy is highlighted by the fact that we can make all of these natural products in 10 steps or less. And we think that now we have a very good platform to access uh, a large, uh, a wide ranging members of all of these natural product families. And we're excited in exploring that in the future. Okay, so it remains for me to thank people that are involved in this project. Uh, the main driver, Behind this project is Xiao Zhang. Uh, he's a very ta highly talented postdoc in my lab coming from Nankai University. And he was joined in this project by Emma Kingsmith and also Li Cheng Yang. I also look like, would like to thank my collaborators uh, in the Shan lab, especially Jeff and Liao Bin who initiated the collaboration. I would like to thank uh, all of the funding sources, especially NIH. And I'd like to th thank you all for your attention and I'll be happy to answer any questions. And a great talk, very impressive indeed. And I'm your round of applause. Thank you. <laughs> uh, so yeah, excellent. So so we got a few questions. Okay, um, and um, so first first of all, we got one. For, you mentioned David Sherman, so maybe we should start with him. So okay. he says, yeah. very nice talk, Hans. Thank you. Are you pursuing structural studies on your P450 and alpha KG enzymes to facilitate future protein, mm -hmm. protein engineering studies to modify selectivity? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. Um, the Shen lab actually is actively exploring that direction. Uh, they actually already have published crystal structure of PTM06. And I, I believe that they have ongoing work in trying to crystallize PTM05. And I think I agree with David that uh, this can enable future engineering studies on these enzymes. Okay, great. Uh, another question from Nick Ch Chiappini from Princeton University. Uh, great talk. Um, for potential of whole cell fungal biocatalysis, can you overexpress the desired P450 to a degree such that it overwhelms the other endogenous P450s and fungal oxygenases? Yes, I believe you can, but uh, I think the problem with this uh, whole, fun whole cell fungal biotransformation that I show is that they don't know which are the P450s that are responsible for the transformation. But in theory, if you know what, the, what's, what P450 is involved in the reaction, you can overexpress that. Okay. And then one other question from Nguyen Don. Mm -hmm. um, thank you for the talk. I'm wondering if the chemoenzymatic reactions is done under aqueous conditions. The substrates of those reactions don't seem re to really like water, so I'm wondering if solubility of substrate has ever been a problem to your reaction. Yes, good catch. Um, we did everything in aqueous buffer. Uh, we used DMSO as our co-solvent. We use 5% DMSO in all of our reactions. And we've gone up to 10 millimolar substrate loading, depending on the reactivity of the enzyme. Uh, in terms of solubility, we do see uh, when we add everything to the mixture, we'll end with a suspension. But I, I think that all that matters is to have a little bit that dissolves and, and, and form the product. And your Chatelier equilibrium would then eventually uh, drive the equilibrium uh, towards the product formation. Okay. Then we got a question from Th uh, Thrindu Ranathunge. Uh, how do you monitor these enzymatic reactions? We typically just let them run overnight, to be honest. I think that's one of the beauty of enzymatic reactions. They are very selective and mild that you don't have to worry about side reactions. You can also, if you want, you can also TLC the reaction. Uh, uh, we've done just uh, taking the flask that contained the uh, reaction suspension, uh, drop in a TLC spotter to the reaction and spot it on TLC plate. That works too. Okay. 
So, so a question from me. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I'm tremendously impressed with what you've achieved here and the, the, the way you're controlling the selectivity so nicely by choosing the right enzyme. But um, how easy is it, is it to, you know, to, to, to get that enzyme to work? In other words, uh, to, to, to get the enzyme you need, to be able to scale it up in an appropriate way. You know, obviously, there's lots of the audience that are like me who come from more mm -hmm. traditional synthetic background. Yeah. So maybe you can give us a, a little bit of an introduction of how easy it was for you to do this. Uh, to get the enzyme you need, uh, you can, there are many companies out there that can do DNA synthesis for you. So you, if you have the protein sequence, you can simply order the uh, requisite expression factor to express the enzymes. And from there, you can just introduce those factors into E. coli or other strains or other organisms of your choice and then do that uh, to express your proteins. Uh, sometimes you have to play some tricks to optimize the enzyme expression. Some, en some enzymes just don't express very well. And I, I think it's all empirical at this point. You just have to try and see whether they express well or not. I see, great. Mm -hmm. Well, Hans, thank you. A very impressive talk. Oh, thank you, Genju. It's very impressive. Congratulations. Thanks.